Oh man, a ton. What's the application? Like you're talking about chord melody and then there are your versions. Knowing that stuff. Yeah. What What do you do with it when well, you I mean, sit down and write a song? Yeah, I, I love um, looking at basic triadic kind of harmony, like like a like a folk tune with a, that's like a one four five. So like an example of how I would use that is let's say. Um, Take I, I I always use this as an example. Amazing Grace, like if you're just so that's kind of a simple harmony. Um, if I if I walk through it. I'm looking for places where the notes and the melody share a commonality with a triad. And then I just want to try and find, I mean, this is kind of a smash and grab way of explaining it, but I just want to, I want to find common notes that occur in the melody and a particular triad, picking from the one, four, and five chords. And then I just want to, I want to find the most reasonable place to play it. Because you could go, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That works, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But trying to find, like, you could, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Just, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to just like, like yeah. just like that. But I'm trying to think. Okay, if I want to go to the two chord, for example, do a two five one two five one. I could go two five one, or I could go two five one, or I could go two five one. You know, and that's just exploiting the tr the inversions. So this is the two chord second inversion. So that's where the f the fifth of the chord is on the bottom. Five first inversion, that's where the third is on the bottom, and then one root position where the root is on the bottom. So it's really like, I think a lot of times we uh, we don't explore those because it doesn't seem like, but it's so effective, it's so it's so pretty. It sounds like a whole different, like, that's the vocabulary. Yeah. So you have so many more choices with where the melody is and what chord and mm -hmm. what you choose, so your choices would be different than his choices. Totally. Where, and it's, and that's it's, where your, your stuff comes out if you don't have those choices because you don't know it. Yeah. Then you can't let that so here, here's, a, here's, a great, here's another great example of how inversions give you a million options. So let's take, um, let's take that 2 5 1 and let's play it as a, as a dominant chord instead of as a minor. So major 2, sorry, it's kind of tuned. Um, if I play it with a 9 in it. And then I go through the inversions. The second that you add more notes to a chord, it gives you more inversions, right? So a triad only has three inversions. There's only three notes. So seven chord has um, uh, four inversions, four notes. Um, and with dominant chords, the the inversions that you get, um, well, with any any seventh chord, the inversions that you get are really colorful. So with a dominant nine, for example, if I take it to its first inversion. So this being E7 over G sharp, or E9 over G sharp, I get another way to say that is e, uh, G sharp half diminished. B minor six. Uh, this is, I just call it kind of D Lydian. Um, so how that works is I could go, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but That's the first, the first inversion of that two chord. So instead of playing it as, or I could go, I was blind, but now I see. So that's this, that's the next inversion. I could go, I was blind, but now I see. I don't like that one as much. That's not quite as effective, um, but it's awesome. So what's what's new? <laughs> Yeah. 
what you do is you take you take the notes and you just flip them around. That's that's the the crudest. So you have to know the notes on the fretboard. You do have to be aware of what you're doing. And yeah. You have to know it in such a fashion that you can go. Here's an F sharp here, and here's an F sharp here, and here's an F sharp here. And yeah. This is a this is a C sharp chord, and I know the names of the, all the notes, and I can yeah. find them on a finger. I like the number system because it does take a little bit of that away, but eventually you do have to learn the the letter names. It is really valuable, and and um, for that, that's where people will go. You should learn the circle of fifths or the cir circle of four fifths and fourths, which are basically the same thing, just going in different directions. Um, but so just being aware of like what does it mean when I say one, three, and five? It's a particular notes from the major scale, and then the way that I teach it to people is by going through the major scale on one string, one finger, nothing fancy, kind of like I did before. And being aware that each one of those notes is a number in that sequence. And then, and then, and yeah. I'm, and I make people, like if any of my students are watching this, they, they always laugh because I go, okay, now say those numbers out loud and they're always like shy. It's like, don't be shy, you know? One, two, three, four, five, oops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. One, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That's the leg work. That's the legwork. But really, like once you do that, once once you kind of like acknowledge the importance of the major scale and those relate the, the relationships, that's the biggest part of work of the work. And the rest of it is just trying to be aware and be present enough to kind of notice little patterns that happen. Yeah. But like once you have that and you understand that the major scale is just a, a, a basically it's a it's a unit of measure for music. Even if we're talking about other scales, people like a, pen, a minor pentatonic, somebody would say minor pentatonic, the formula is one flat three, four, five flat seven, one. And what that means is how that scale is different from a major scale. So it's got a one instead of a one, no two. It's got a flat three instead of a three, four, five, flat seven instead of natural seven. That, that's where that comes from. So it's like the major scale, even when you're not looking at it, is like a unit of measure. So I like, I like how you, you played like the inversions and gave an example. Yeah. As opposed to, okay, do the work, and one day you'll be a great guitar player. <laughs> it's like, right. well, this is what you want to be able to say on the instrument. You have these choices. Yeah. So you have to start with one finger saying the notes out loud. Yeah. So that you can figure it, you can find it. Well, and I always get like, I'll go, do you know a major scale? If I'm having a lesson with somebody, they go, yeah. They go, okay, slow down. Where's the six? Yeah, exactly. And then that's when they go, uh. And where's so, the six here? Where's the six on this string? Where's yeah. The six? Yeah. And that's and I think that's that's the if I could say there's one plague amongst guitar players, it's that we are pa like pattern and position based, which is not a bad thing necessarily, but we use it as a crutch a lot of times. And a lot of people go like, I just want to learn some theory, so that oh man, me too. I, I'm, I'm not excluding myself at all. It's like I just want to learn some theory so that um, I can be better. It's like it's not about theory. It's about being present and being aware. Like if you just sit there and you go, oops. And you're like, man, I should get some bread later, make some sandwiches for dinner or something, you know. It's a very intentional practice. Yeah, ex ex of, exactly. And that's, and that's what I would say. It's like spend, spend a little bit of time, like even though your ears are going to guide you, like because most of us have, have the ears to like, like we were talking about earlier, like you make a mistake and you go, ah, how did you know you made a mistake? Well, my ears told me, you know. Yeah. You rely on your ears, but then going forward and going like, Okay, but what, like, what are these notes? Where do they come from? Why do they work? Yeah. You know, in so the I think you've got a great way of just doing that fretboard with the dry erase board. I've got, yeah. I've got that. At, I've got that at my house to be able to see that. Visually. Having that visualization, being able to see it as it is underneath your hands on a big dry erase board, and go, oh, there it is. Not, you know, trying to guess about it in so your head. So what's the what's the dry erase board about? Like, what do you, what do, you do with that? I basically drew the fretboard just like that, with the with the lines and the dots and everything, yeah. and I mapped out the major scale as he's talking about it with the number value for each note. Uh, and you don't have to learn it that way with the numbers on it, because uh, it, it becomes really easy to, to do what he's talking about, do pattern based, whenever you're visualizing it that way. Uh, and I feel like that was for me the breakthrough to be able to remember all that stuff was to see the patterns in in blocks, so I just learned that section, and then this section, and this section, and this section, and then put it all together. It gets a bit daunting when you're learning it one string at a time, trying to go all the way up. Uh, and the only one that's going to fall out of order for symmetry is, is that G. And oh yeah, we were talking about that earlier. Yeah, we were talking yeah. about that earlier. It was like, open uh, yeah. uh, and I was like, eh, you know, 
I a lot of times leave this G out, you know, because I don't I don't always remember where that one is. Oh, yeah. And he's like, oh, I do the same thing, and it's because right. there's there's a that's the only one that's out of symmetry. Yeah. So here, here's a this is a prime example of that. So if I wanted to play D major arpeggio, and I wanted to play it like in the standard tuning, we have a lot of nice sort of well, I mean, there's there's this, a similar phenomenon in standard tuning, but the inversion is different, and so it sort of changes the way things. I mean, technically, actually, there's that inversion in this, too, but just go with me. Um, uh, if we wanted to lay out, you know, in standard tuning, we like to do things like, you know, we'll do uh, two notes per string, or, you know, stuff like that for, for pa uh, scale patterns or three notes per string or whatever, arpeggio, same thing. Um, if you do that in open... <laughs> It doesn't quite line up the same way, and if you want it to go this way, you know, it, you run into some problems. But what I what I found is if I take that third out of the equation, oops. Now I'm losing myself. You get it. Whatever. <laughs> diminished. Uh, I always get stuck on the diminished. Uh, I'm skipping one. Anyway, we'll figure it out. We'll edit it in later. Uh, yeah. That's a lot of information. It's a lot of information. Somebody, somebody's got a headache. Right now. I have a headache right now, but I think it's from the coffee. Yeah, so, when you, so when you have all of that information, both of you are great songwriters, how, what's, what's the connection between what you know and sitting down and writing a song? Do you, do you just start noodling on a guitar? Do you pick up a certain guitar and hear a certain thing? Do you have a musical idea? Or is it... Is it a separate thing, like two sides of your brain? I don't think there's any wrong way to do it. Uh, but, either, yeah. either way, you're going to get to the same conclusion. Uh, I think for me, I I just kind of sit down and start noodling on the guitar, and then I'm like, wow, that was fun. How can I make that bigger and just you know build on that? I don't have any great intention about it. I think Joey probably has a little more intention about the way he writes things than I do because I don't fully understand it as well as he does. That chord melody stuff gets Joey, is that gets true? really heady. <laughs> um, I, I mean, there's like to to me when it comes to writing and actually just practicing and being creative. I think it's like it's it's re you know the for for me because I I love the analytical side and I love to map things out and and sort of go like with inversions. That's born out of I just like to find all the different ways that I can play something you know like when I was a kid learning to play the guitar I'd learn a new chord and then I would try to figure out how to play that exact same voicing all over the fretboard and like sometimes they weren't even useful or applicable or but it was just like it, you know before I knew anything about music I was going like ah, okay there's that one and then okay okay so if this is that then this is that you know do, going through that process one note at a time so um, but that's not really where creativity comes from from that from the analytical side so for me it's like it's really important to I don't know I kind of like I, I supplement the emotional side of making art with this sort of scientific side behind the so how do you get out of your head I I, I, I mean it sounds uh, I, I just I just try not to think about any of that and just react emotionally yeah. so if something makes me feel something then I, I follow it and then every now and then I'll let I'll let like sort of my musical brain or the theory brain kind of come in and go oh maybe you know maybe you should maybe you should try a substitution of that like you know if you're going going to the four minor I might go okay well I wonder what the playing a substitution for that chord I wonder what that might sound like but but it's but it's mostly like I'm looking for the I'm looking for the option that's going to make me feel the most, and that's and that's kind of how I marry those two. Yeah, it almost seems like you have two different toolboxes. You've got you load up on the analytical theory side, yeah, and then you have a creative side with emotions and experiences and and being able 
to flip between those two in the songwriting process is, is important. So yeah, it's a little bit of code switching, but I think it's like, uh, it, like the, the theory side of things is, is exactly that. It's a toolbox that I can use to archive, archive the things that I know. Like I know that I love the way, and I overuse it probably, I love the way playing the four as a minor six chord feels and sounds. I love the way it makes me feel. I know that it's the four minor six because of theory, but I, but I, but I keep track of it based on the way it makes me feel. You know what I mean? vocabulary with the inversions and, and voicings and stuff, um, how do like guitars influence your songwriting? Like you pick up one guitar compared to another guitar, does it feel like the tool that you pick has a part to play in what you hear and the choices that you make? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's, what, what do you kind of listen for? Is it a feel thing? Is it exploring how that sounds and finding what notes? Kind of resonate. I mean, I, I yeah, all, all of the above. I, I, I don't, I don't know how you feel about stuff, but like, like for me, uh, the creative side of things is really important that it stays rooted in the emotional. Uh, so, I'm always, I'm always auditing like how something makes me feel. If it makes me feel the right way, I'll pick up a guitar and go, nope. That's, not today. that's, this is not for this song, yeah. you know, or even I've been, I've, I, I mean, I've even been starting to explore uh, other open tunings like open G and open A, which are really similar and also really different all at the same time. It just sort of, it's, it's a very similar tuning, but at the layout, but where the triad is, is different, which changes the whole thing and will, ins will inspire me to do something different where I just go like in, it's in, in that case for me, it's always a mistake. Like, oh shit, that's not where it is in the other tuning. Oh, that was cool. And then I, I'm like a, I'm like a dog at the off leash park. I just yeah. like to, I like, I like to chase the music. Well, it almost sounds like just being open to exploring stuff. You pick up this guitar, not that guitar. You try this tuning. Oh, I made a mistake, but let me figure that out. Yeah. Being open to feeling a little bit uncomfortable, like, yeah. like Seth was talking last night about um, having an R and B gig during the week. Yeah. yeah. Has a standard tune guitar now and plays on it. Oh man, yeah. those guys kicked my ass. Yeah, what's Thursday. that about? Yeah, uh, I'm getting to sit in with some of the best guys around Tulsa, where I live, and uh, a lot of these guys, you know, play in the churches around there, and they are highly educated, very, very skilled musicians. How's, how's what they play different than like your typical Monday night at the college? Well, I think what what I do is mostly blues and Americana. And what those guys do is more R and B and funk, and and jazz. They do some jazz standards, and, and that's really out of my wheelhouse for what I do with my guys. Even the other band that I play with, with Jared Tyler, his stuff is more of a Nashville sound and kind of music. And, and it's not. I don't want to say predictable because that's definitely not a good description of his music. But uh, it's it's not what these guys are doing. I'm comfortable there. Uh, it's a language that you speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Was it kind of scary walking into your first R&B gig with those guys? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it's, every week it's scary. Are you yeah. kidding me? Those guys are yeah. a little over my how head. Do you, how do you get over that? Yeah. Do you you, you don't. It? You, just show you up. don't. You just show up and you do you your job. In, you plug in. And yeah. Don't and be a bitch. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think there's like uh, something that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, especially in this era where like we are like we experience so much things so much of the world through our phones through our computers and and it gets really easy to like lose touch with reality anything that forces us to be present is taking us like truly present like you're playing in standard tuning you can't you can't just like coast because if you start to coast you start to play things in that <laughs> that are gonna sound horrible mm -hmm. you know and that was what changing to open tuning did for me was like I, by no stretch was I uh, a master of standard tuning, but I'd gotten to a point where I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, I mean, realistically, I could have taken a lesson with somebody, but at that time, I wasn't doing that, and and yeah. I just didn't know. How, I didn't know how to play something new, and and I didn't. You know, I, I I had run out of things that I could show myself, so I changed the tuning and started exploring other kinds of music, and and it was it was scary, 
and I would go like I'd go to on dance band gigs with my open tuned guitar and just be like, okay, uh, Michael Jackson, PYT, good luck, yeah. you know, just like there's all these crazy Quincy Jones uh, sus chords and you know I, but but it taught me so much about music and and what I learned was like if I'm in it and I'm looking at the fretboard and I'm like it is you and me right now and I'm gonna deliberately use my feelings and what I know about music to get me through this situation. I always leave feeling satisfied. And that's, that was a pretty massive discovery for me. Like we always chase after that, like remember that magical gig and I played that solo and like every, everyone connected with the universe, man, and it was beautiful. Those moments are always had when you're like, I'm in it. They're never had when you're like, oh man, oh, I should pick us some bread. You know. yeah. When you're present, and it seems like a combination of, of bringing your experience, but also combining that with having a beginner mindset. That yeah. happened because you were able to show up and be a beginner. You know you're going to get curb stomped walking into an R&B game, but you show up and you bring what you have, yeah. and, and then something magic happens because yeah. you're able to be uncomfortable. And I think sure. we... I think we've, that's, that's, I, yeah. I think we feel that every day. Pressure makes it diamond. It totally does. Yeah. I mean, oh. like... Like this week at the shop has been really rough. We feel like beginners, you know. It, but having that mindset and being open to it, you, like you know what's on the other side of it because you're open to learning. If yeah. we just power through with what we think, you know, we know. Pro yeah. You know, progress is always made when you open your mind and allow yourself to be uncomfortable. You Why know, to make once mistakes. Yeah, and ch be challenged by something that that, like. Walking into a gig with a guitar that's in a different tuning and yeah. just being like, "Okay, I'm I'm open to whatever I'm gonna learn." Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's like, it's almost like that. You could use that as a radar. You know, like I talk about that with the resonators. Is like resonators are weird. They sound crazy. Like, <laughs> yeah. what tuning is it in? What strings do I use? Yeah. But if you're able to like approach it and go like, "Okay, I don't know what sounds good on this." Yeah. You can't strummy strum strum on this and make it sound okay. No, you can't touch that instrument the way you touch you anything can't. else. Yeah. And if you're if you're okay to like get over that uncomfortable feeling, you start going, Well, who plays these things? Who makes these sound good? Oh, you know, who's um, Lowell George, right? Like you're playing that sound like, okay, like what do you play on that to make it sound good? Yeah. Like what tuning is this? Who plays an open, you know, D tuning? What does that sound like? And suddenly you hearing new people and learning new stuff mm -hmm. and it's a really enriching thing but if you're okay playing in standard tuning and playing Zeppelin all the time you'll never have that experience sure. so yeah. using uncomfortable feelings as a radar like you're on the right track yeah if you can be brave brave and courageous and present then whenever you get comfortable it always feels like a plateau because it is it's like you're you're yeah. you're running up a mountain and you've got a minute to take take a breath but I mean, like this is all we could all make like, um, like a office building um, positivity posters out of everything we're talking about right now. But like, you get to this place where you're like, the, you know, the cat keep hanging on. <laughs> you like cats? I have cat socks on right now. Oh man, I love cats. <laughs> Seth loves cats. We're gonna have to get a, a sock picture. We will have to get a sock picture. <laughs> this is all said and done. I went and took my socks off just to be different. <laughs> um, but no, you get you get comfortable. And that's and that's okay for a minute, but it's always that's always when I get messages from people going, I uh, you know, yeah. I'm I'm stuck. You go, okay, try something new. That's the only thing you need to do. Right. You you will not get unstuck by playing the same thing yeah. on the same guitar in the same way. Yeah. You know, walk walk over to a piano, try something on a piano, right. teach yourself, you know, Absolutely. whatever whatever it is, just do something different, I and that's what's going to get you moving again. Poster part of this though, because so much of like playing music now is gear review videos yeah. or check out my Nashville licks, you know. And I think what we're missing in the phone one minute video kind of thing yeah. is the emotional component. Well, you know, what can you learn as a person? Like, what can guitar playing as a mechanism teach you? How to be present, how to we be were, a beginner. We, we were talking about this earlier where we're like, you know, Seth was talking about his house gigs and just like, I don't do them for any other reason other than the love. It's like, don't do it for the money. I don't do it for the, you know, the fame. I do it because I love it. And I think, you know, Instagram is amazing because it's allowed us all to connect. That's yeah. how we met. Yeah, that, we're that's all how we here met. because of that. Yeah. Uh, so many of um, I, those, the, the pedal show guys 
dear friends, like dear friends of mine. Yeah. I met them through, basically through the internet. Yeah. Um, Lee Anderson, same thing. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing, but what I think a lot of times, like that, that volume of exposure to other people being successful can really mess with your brain a little bit. Because it, cause it, like, it sets these, these standards in a really weird way and people get super inside their head. And I, like, I find myself always reminding people and, and students and friends even, myself especially, that like, the only reason I do this is because I love it. It makes me feel great. And like, if it makes somebody else feel great, then that makes me feel great back. And then I can do it some more. Yeah. And like, that's why I do it. If I'm able to make a living at it, then that's amazing. Yeah. But I would still do this if it wasn't my job. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't do it the way that I do now because like, you, can't, you can't afford to fly around, yeah. you know, the, the country or the world or whatever, unless you're making money doing it. But um, I would still do it because I, I have no choice. I have to do this. It makes that, me feel I great. Mean, that sounds like part of a principle life, yeah. right? If you use those higher level thoughts to guide what you do and where you go, you can't go wrong, right? What do you love? Do that thing. Now you're on the right track. Yeah. What, are you, what, are you, what are you chasing if you're chasing an engagement, you know, and you don't realize that? Well, now you're going down a weird path and now you don't feel good because you're looking at someone else who's got that engagement you don't know oh, why. Yeah. Right. And, I mean, like, it's the age-old thing, like, it's not the journey, it's the destination, but it's so true. We all get wrapped up in this, like, if I just get that pedal, yeah. or if I just get, if I hit 10,000 followers, or if I hit X, whatever, whatever metric you can possibly ma measure, there's always going to be something. But the reality is, is that if you're not looking it in the face and experiencing that experience, you're missing the entire thing Yeah, and I completely. think like you said earlier, being present is how you're aware that that's happening. Yeah. I don't think anyone is aware that like, I just watched, I just watched a pedal video for four hours, you know, or like, I am just chasing likes. No, I don't think anyone says that in their brain. We're just not present enough to understand, yeah, I am kind of just doing that yeah. You know, for that thing, I gotta kind of check myself a little bit. Yeah. You know, it's like like what you were saying about we all kind of met on social media, but we're here now drinking coffee with but everybody because, here that's because, because we took that step. Yeah. You know. Well, you, and you you uh, I've, since we, since we met, you have always I, the thing that I think I love about you the most and find the most inspiring, is that you, everything you do is for the experience. Like you told me. Uh, this is all about the story for me. The whole thing is about the story. And that's really important to you. And that's a, like, I think that's a really beautiful thing because that's, to me, that's the meaning. The meaning of life to me is like, what is your story? I am not going to give a shit about a closet full of guitars or pedals when I'm breathing my last breath, but I'm going to look back on the stories that I'm, that I've, memories that I made with my friends. That's the shit I'm going to take, you know? Put that on Take a my, poster. Put that on a poster. <laughs> Hang in there. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like this is a this can be such a great mechanism for a bunch of people who like the same shit. Yeah. And that's what exactly what this is. This is our community softball league. Yeah. You know, this is how we make friends and be like, wait, why why can we meet once? I mean, you guys met fleetingly here, yeah. you know, a couple months ago and we ate sushi and then it was like, hey guys, you want to come and record some videos? And Seth spent 24 hours in an airport, and you flew from Winnipeg to escape the, the polar vo vortex. Yes. And we're oh, here wow. in Saginaw. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you guys met once to yeah. do that. And it was like, yeah, but these are my people. Yeah. And using that as a mechanism like, to find those people but is I'll, super powerful. Yeah. It's, not about, it's not about specs. It's not about how long you dry that maple with what nut with, with whatever. It's yeah. like, hey, I build guitars, you guys play guitars, you wanna be my friend? <laughs> yeah, know? And it's like, yeah. yes, we do, yeah. and it's cool, and it's real. Yeah. You know? And that's, like you said, it's like, that's the real shit. Yeah.